Well, good. Soviet Wombo is in the Vietnam War. There's no way this can backfire. This is random rising storm to BS from our boy, Soviet Wombo. Let's get into it. Oh, guess oh, what happened. Please don't be racist. Go smell some Oh, man. Well, at least, at least he's trying. At least he's trying. If you've seen any of his other videos, you know the, the odds are against us. Hey, Palm. Yeah? You guys. Oh, oh Jesus oh, Christ! Wow, that is an intense explosion very close to you. I'm here to tell you, usually if you're that close to an explosion, like a grenade or something, you're you're pretty much done. So the grenades are lethal within like, I want to say it's like five meters. So so what does damage to the human body in a in a blast is two things. First is the actual concussive force. That is the kinetic energy of of an actual explosion right and within a certain radius of any explosive that concussive energy is enough to d deal damage to organs much like the way the impact of a car crash can damage your organs can actually pull and rip things out of place um yeah you came you, things are getting dark just like a car crash though the other danger is in the kinetic energy that other objects get from that explosive and in the case of a grenade the grenades are actually designed to produce shrapnel tiny pieces of metal that then get sent outward in all directions um empowered right, loaded with the kinetic energy of that explosive and those have a much larger kill radius but they can be much more inconsistent right they may there may be no uh no shrapnel in some angles and in other angles there may be a ton of shrapnel and it depends on where it hits and how much protection the individuals are wearing etc etc so have you got the same ptsd i do now yeah i do now depress the shit yeah we have taken you claim nice you oh ptsd actually so Two people can experience the same trauma, um, but it may manifest differently in terms of PTSD. Uh, PTSD can include things all the way uh, to hallucinations and the flashbacks that you think of as being sort of stereotypical of the Vietnam War. Um, you can also have, of course, um, emotional dysregulation. For example, fits of rage, bouts of crying. Um, you can also, you, sometimes they can be triggered by sights, sounds, and smells that resemble combat. Um, then of course, on the other side, you can also have sort of a numbing effect in which people report their, uh, emotional range shrinks considerably. Uh, for example, they have neutral feelings about the birth of a child or uh getting married right they're unable to summon up a uh, tremendous joy or tremendous sadness it's uh so ptsd symptoms can cover an incredibly wide range which is why diagnosis can sometimes be very very tough oh, wow digby fucking you're looking hell. where is he digby have you been working out pretty ripped <laughs> pretty pretty ripped Tactical wants to know what the premise is. Well, basically, during the the sort of Cold War, the communist bloc was trying to uh, spread influence across the world, you see. And we are following Nixon's policy of containment. No. That's why we're here. Okay, it's 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 not quite... It, it's a little more complicated. Because you have to remember that the... So, okay. North Vietnam and South Vietnam were supposed to be split uh, following the... Following World War II uh, and the Japanese occupation, right? And that's where the North Vietnamese, uh, the Ho Chi Minh and his movement uh, began to coalesce to resist the Japanese occupation. Then the French, the previous colony holders, um, tried to take over it again in this uh, and keep it as Indochina. Um, and then you had, uh, as the French withdrew, I believe there was the French withdrew to like a North and South Vietnam because there was a strong divide between Catholics, so, either an ethnic group division or a Catholic. You know what? I don't remember. You guys should look it up on Wikipedia. Hearts this and is, minds. This is, this is your With history. the war that you lost. America Thank you. Never loses a war. What's Saigon called? Sorry? It was a what what's Saigon called right about now? What's, what's the city of Saigon called right now? Have you guys listened to uh, all the Hanoi Hana stuff? 
Oh, yeah. yeah. All the stuff that they basically blasted at the GIs in yeah. the jungle. The radio personality under like the pseudonym Hanoi Hannah, Help. speaking in English no, at the GIs. It's that. like, How are you, GI Joe? And then she'd go off and say, like, communist propaganda in the sort of <laughs> sultry, sultry Vietnamese voice. Must admit, not my proudest wank. <laughs> Yeah, this is actually true um, on both sides. There was, of course, U.S. Uh, US propaganda that did the exact same thing. Famously, the United States would actually broadcast into the, the jungles where they thought that uh, North Vietnamese troops were located. Um, it was actually recordings meant to sound very ethereal, and it was supposed to be the voices of ancestors begging their... Uh, well, descendants to put down their arms and not die senselessly. Um, so both sides try to engage in this war of influence. Uh, people actually hated uh, Jane Fonda, the uh, big actress of the era, because the North Korean or the North Vietnamese propaganda arm actually invited her to the country. She posed on an anti-aircraft gun and generally did sort of a press tour of North Vietnam, which is kind of like, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It'd be like Justin, no, no, Justin Bieber's Canadian. It'd be like Tom Cruise um, touring an ISIS compound, posing with ISIS members, being like, yeah, that's how that's about how that landed. Um, not a great look for a celebrity. <laughs> but it just goes to show how strong the anti-war movement was. Um, and sort of in the way that celebrities, um, they are idiots. Um, they don't actually sometimes understand even the core purpose of movements. And so, but their constant vapid need for attention means that they thrust themselves into issues in which they have absolutely no business. And oftentimes because celebrities are also greedy, they don't realize that sometimes that they can actually just use their tremendous wealth to just write a check to a cause they believe in and not have to make it a bid for attention. Um, as a result, of course, you end up with celebrities believing that their presence in is, sometimes helps. Uh, think about Sean Penn going to Ukraine in the midst of a refugee crisis um, where he doesn't appear to have helped anything, um, but instead seems to have mucked, every, mucked things up uh, during a time in which massive, massive uh, numbers of refugees are trying to cross the border. And there's Sean Penn, like, renting cars and trying to, you know, d document things when he should have just you know, stayed home and written checks with his tremendous wealth and not made it a look at me event. <laughs> What's your weapon, Digby? I have a flamethrower. Oh, God. Anyway, the point is it, it dates back all the way, probably to before Jane Fonda doing that and not understanding that you can not, that supporting the anti-war movement in the United States is not the same thing as supporting the North Vietnamese, right? The two are pretty different. Well, we're all Though there's definitely a couple of cringe lords, even back then, in the time before cringe was really a thing, that were still like 19-year-old college students who thought they were being edgy by being like flying the North Vietnamese flag. You're just like, you fucking cringy loser. We're going to die of friendly fire. I have my flammenwerfer. Flammenwerfer. I can worth flammen. <laughs> the hills are alive with the sounds of... <laughs> so a lot of people forget that some of the earliest and most intense urban combat that was seen in the Vietnam War was during the Tet Offensive in cities like Hue uh, in the center of the country. This was... So, okay, the Tet Offensive was a time... Okay, more context. There's the North Vietnamese army. This was the uniformed and trained army of the state of North Vietnam, which the U.S. never tried to conquer, was an independent state, and sought to overthrow the, the South, South Vietnam. Totally different state. Um, then you had the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong was an insurgent movement of South Vietnamese who were communists, who wanted to overthrow the South Vietnamese government and install a communist government in the South. So these are two separate forces that, as you can probably imagine, collaborated very closely. And early in the Vietnam War, the Tet Offensive was when the Viet Cong guerrillas launched a coordinated uh, attack on numerous targets across the country, the most prominent of which was, of course, in uh, urban areas like Hue City and I believe the U.S. Embassy. Um, it was a tactical defeat, right? The Viet Cong were 
routed by obviously U.S. regular troops and South Vietnamese regular troops, um, but it was a propaganda victory for the uh, Viet Cong because uh, the U.S. military had reported that the Viet Cong presence was near defeat, was uh, being just demolished every day, and that the Viet Cong threat was going to be eliminated shortly. And instead, they somehow managed to show up in every major city in Vietnam and attack very sensitive U.S. targets, uh, told the U.S. public that their generals had probably been lying to themselves and overestimating uh, how effective they had been at exterminating the VC. That said, the Tet Offensive actually did sort of exterminate the VC. Um, they were unable to mount further dis distinct military operations, but what they instead moved into a role as support for the North Vietnamese army, which became the primary fighting wing. But the North Vietnamese army relied heavily on the Viet Cong and other friendly pro-communist uh, party members in the South to do things like um, actually guard and guide them to food caches and supplies that the v the army would need to fight. Um, the North Vietnamese army supply ch supply system was, well, constantly being bombed, right? That's the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, so they would rely, these units, whole battalions would come into the south and they would arrive at a village and the local uh, VC or Communist Party representative would say, oh, welcome, welcome to the village. Uh, here are some safe places that you can go nearby that you can dig your fighting positions because they always had to dig in to avoid to stay safe from U.S. Uh, aircraft bombardment. And then they would the guide would say, oh, and here is the location of all of your stored food. This is rice, and you can also get food from this source or that source. Sometimes they would even say uh, the local VC would actually say, hey, we're going to send all the women to market um, and they're all going to buy just like a couple of extra uh, pieces of meat or what have you. And that will be the your food for the week that you're in our area before you move on on your journey. With songs they have sung for a thousand. Because that local knowledge is invaluable as the Russians are finding out in Ukraine. Oh, I run out of flame. <laughs> <laughs> this is where they learn lessons about Ho Chi Minh, the man who invented the instant noodle. Konnichiwa. <laughs> okay, so here's what's really interesting. Yes, there was a lot of um, communist propaganda. Um, so this is not an unrealistic look. I mean, I think this is probably a little bit nicer than a typical blackboard. But oftentimes what the communists would do in the uh, rural villages was that they would offer education. So they would teach people how to read. Obviously, the reading would, would have a sort of Communist Party bend to it, um, but educating the rural population was a big part of it. And, you know, we think of primarily the terrible things that the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army did, which, you know, killing, uh, killing village members that were either not agreeable to communism or that spoke out against it or were administrators for the South Vietnamese state, right? Um, stringing them up or beheading them and leaving them in town squares and, and engaging in that level of brutality. But almost all of these movements also had a, a uh, positive propaganda effort, right? The U.S. was the same way. They did some horrible things to the Vietnamese people, but they also tried to improve agriculture uh into the agriculture industry, bring lots of modern farming techniques, donated uh, fertilizer, produced, uh, tried very hard to establish rural education systems, right? So both sides were engaging in this, in this uh, targeted violence to stop against people who were against their side and engaging in sort of uh, bribes, positive propaganda. Um, and education on both sides was a big part of it. The other thing that's really interesting is that the North Vietnamese army had this technique uh, that they called criticism. And this was when after an engagement or a mission, um, there would be an expectation that uh, members of the unit actually called each other out on things that they did wrong. And obviously they were expected to be uh, polite, but to say, hey, I noticed that you, um, you know, didn't, 
didn't take a good position or you didn't fire your weapon as aggressively as you could have, or you had grenades, but you didn't throw them when we needed to. Um, and there were some rules, like if someone was a member of the communist party, they couldn't be criticized by non-communist party members, but this sort of brutal collective, uh, uh, self-improvement program um, actually did make units better. And a lot of even captured North Vietnamese troops said that the criticism really improved the cohesiveness of the fighting unit because everyone was subject to it. No one was above it. Ho Chi Minh, the man who invented the instant noodle. Konnichiwa. Shit, fuck. Ah. It's Fubar. My situation is Fubar. I have literally never heard Fubar used like non-sarcastically also adolf hitler is here for some reason you're in the wrong war hitler he survived he survived and made it to nam just to get drafted again he would have been like right in his like 60s Welcome oh, to the rice fields motherfucker oh shit i killed a friendly with that willie pete sorry about that hitler <laughs> you're apologizing to hitler Ooh, we're killing him with Willy P. Willy P is, of course, a euphemism for right, white phosphorus. This is uh, something that's used to officially destroy equipment because it is extremely hot chemical, an extremely hot chemical reaction, and can be brutal if it gets on your skin. Um, so it's hot enough that it will, if you deploy a Willy P grenade on the roof of a Humvee, it will burn straight through the engine block and come out the other side. So you really don't want to get it on you. Hitler, careful, Hitler! Oh, I'm in the gear now. We've got it, we've got it. Ice Wallacum. What's Ice Wallacum? I've... No, Jesus. No idea. <laughs> ice Wallacum? Okay, so it's a bit. Oh my god, I fucking see it. Fuck. Oh, he's so dumb. How do you get how do you walk into that? My chat, seriously. At least when they did it to me, it was Russian. Can you help me take the police station? Alrighty, on my way. Okay, really? Go, go, Digi, go! Clearing, clearing, clear. Ow. Go, push, push, push. Shooting Got him. How many of you did he kill? I didn't open fire because I would have barbecued the both of them. DC no, then shot me. Shot and then you shot me. Shot There's a lot of complaining for dead people. Also, they have these old school rucksacks, extremely old school. Normally, before you assault a position, you're going to want to ditch your rucksack. You're going to put it down um, and secure it, right? Because it makes you so much slower. So slow that apparently in one North Vietnamese guy can really mess you up. Nice. You're all idiots. I did. Oh Christ. Oh no, good spooky. Good spooky. Where the spooky uh, yep, they've shut it down. Enemy enemy. Shit, 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 I mean, so this is what happens when you have uh well this is what made the rice field rice patties considered so dangerous is because they were totally open terrain. And not only were they totally open, but because rice fields are flooded and that's to prevent weeds from growing because rice can survive in a flooded field, but nothing else can. So it's an early natural form of, um, of, um, weed killer, right? They were flooded. So you couldn't actually get down. You had to poke your head up. So if you were to say, you know, to, like go prone and flat in a rice field you would you would drown if you were there for more than a few minutes so you would have you would get ambushed and you would have very few places to go you would have to run to one of the ditches um it's a brutal place to get caught and of course the north vietnamese were experts at catching u.s troops out in the open please stop dying give me a squad that stays alive for two seconds Life is good. Uh, Quebec, life is good. You just hit half the team. Life is good. So what he's using is an SKS. He's on the North Vietnamese side. I can't take D all by myself. Well, I'm sure you can take plenty of D all by yourself. <laughs> that was just a good one. Yeah, <laughs> can you guys stop being dead? We're trying our best here. Try harder. The, the commander is full. So a hamlet, capturing a hamlet, is a term for a Vietnamese village. Um, there was a program called the Strategic Hamlet Program, and the idea, this is, this is the sort of hubris that the U.S. fought that war, and they fought the Afghan war with, um, though there was no program like this in Afghanistan. So the Strategic Hamlet Program was that the U.S. decided that there was a Communist Party representative in every village, which was probably true. And to stop those Communist Party members from accessing these villages, uh, they would just consolidate all the villagers in these big hamlets that had lots of protection and had lots of vetting and were really secure. 
And this was dumb for a bunch of reasons. One, because they just brought all the Communist Party members into the hamlets along with everyone else. Um, so it didn't really help. And yes, it meant that in some instances, the North Vietnamese uh, military couldn't, for example, act, use the villagers for support. But uh, imagine having your like ancestral home, uh, you forced out of it and it's burned down around you. Um, if your goal is to win hearts and minds, that's a real good way to not. Oh, oh. Uh. Are, are you died? Uh, no, you died? no. Oh, Christ, Digby. Oh, fuck oh. me. Wow, RPG just we just got fucked. Yeah, wow, that's imp that's impressive from an RPG. I was really that looked like a mortar strike. This is good. Just clear the way. We're moving in. Oh, flight, oh, actually. Right. Oh my god, my butthole is clenched. Oh my god. B Matt says Quebec's voice makes his panties wet. <laughs> his panties? Oh no. Wait, what? <laughs> He's pouring water into yeah, his tighty whitey. Yeah, that's Got a jug of squat. <laughs> Basically, when I move the mic right in front of my mouth, I sound like kind of an ASMR podcast presenter guy. Right. That's it. Okay. I should do ASMR. There we go. I'm not going to do ASMR. We put it right there. There we are. Start reading like Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of ah! <laughs> Yes. I, I can feel the ASMR. Let's go. Grenade! <laughs> You're right. That's the weirdest sound you've made so far. Grenade! Yes, it was really common to draft, well, young people. So the way the draft worked in Vietnam was a lottery system, and everyone would have a certain number associated with their birth date. And uh, live before, live on television, actually, uh, the U.S. Uh, representative would have all the birthdays in a, all the undrafted birthdays in a big old bin, and they would spin it around, they'd reach in and pull out a ball, and they'd be like, 36. So everyone who had number 36, let's say that was the, I don't know, the 36th day of the year. So February, I don't know, 4th or something. Um, they would say, if you have a February 4th birthday and you're over 18 and you don't have an exception, report to your nearest draft office, nerds. Um, and the exceptions would be if you had a family. So if you had kids or were, and were married, this was the 70s, having kids and being married was something that was completely possible for a 19 year old um then also if you were in actively enrolled in college you could defer your draft um and then of course medically if you had a medical excuse um through mental or physical illness you could all avoid the draft of course this meant that the draft disproportionately targeted um vulnerable young non-college bound uh, kids, oftentimes urban, poor, more likely to be um, black or Hispanic. Uh, so it, you know, when people talk about sort of the, well, this this is why they, they called it sort of racist. And there, there's probably some validity to it, though basically the US was just like, yeah, I, 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 think, I think giving you an out to go to college was dumb. <laughs> I mean, drafting people was dumb, frankly. And but if you're going, if you're in a national crisis that is so severe that you actually truly need to draft your able bodied males, I'm thinking like Ukraine, right? The enemy is literally marching through your country. Um, then whether or not you finish your degree in business management is not is not the decisive factor. Like it's it, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's that noise? Southeast, okay. Gotta get your nose down range. That guy has. Um, oh! Just God, what is wrong with you? What on earth is wrong with you? Uh, you TK Penelope me. Penelope. Penelope. Say that again. TK Penelope. <laughs> so this pie is really good. Don't try and change the subject. Hey Soviet, can you cover me while I go up this ladder completely exposed? Uh, that's a very interesting climbing technique. Wow. You're using. Uh, Dr. Sylvia, could you go fast? <laughs> I got killed by Theresa May, apparently. <laughs> Theresa May eats chi. I guess she's like a, like a ninja now. She's like a, like, not a ninja, I'm sorry. Uh, chi is a Chinese, uh, medical, like Chinese, you know, traditional medicine concept. We have the chi energy. So Theresa May eats it like some sort of greedy, mythical dragon creature. Just your chi energy just getting clump, clump, clump.
Really? <laughs> Does this constitute as a hard Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not music, it's electronic devices and toasters going wub wub wub. I like the wubs. You like the wubs? I like the wubs. What's wrong with you? Smoke's quite long lasting, which is good. What on earth? <laughs> okay. Late for a grenade conference. That's an unusually specific thing for the grenade to be doing. No, there's one across the road for me. Watch yourself. Oh, wow. That same yep, bullet yep, killed yep, the two yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that single bullet killed both of you simultaneously. Yep. That was pretty fucking cool. I mean, maybe for you, I'm dead. <laughs> Gotta love that neutral facial expression. Not sound good. A floating tree. The Vietnamese surely have a technological edge over us with this. So one of the things that's really interesting to remember about the Vietnam War and the U.S. military at that time is while a significant portion of the combat power was draftees, the non-commissioned officer corps and much of the officer corps, the senior officer corps, uh, had accrued a lot of combat experience. Because remember, the U.S. had been at war from of course, 1941 to 1945, then was at war again from 1949 until 1958 in the Korean War, and then again in was at war from 19, what is it, 63 to like 69 was the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, all that to say that you had an insane amount of combat experience. You couldn't ask for a more experienced military than what the U.S. was fielding. And it was unlike, uh, it, but, it, but the fact that it's still lost in Vietnam, though the North Vietnamese deserve a lot of credit, they had been fighting nonstop against the Japanese occupation in World War II, then switched to fighting the French occupiers in Indochina, then kicked them out and then fought the Americans. So unfortunately, it's almost in a way tragic that the, North Viet the Vietnam War took two of perhaps some of the most experienced militaries uh, in terms of their leadership it, it to maybe exist in the 20th century and made them just fight each other uh, for absolutely no meaningful reason. Whoa. It's all right, man. Hang in there. I got you. No! What's the Vietnamese name? Oh, Christ, grenade. His name is something Wong. Something. <laughs> it's not even Vietnamese, but it's fine. <laughs> something Wong. Oh, you can't God. say that. You can't oh, say God. that. Oh, That's racist. Oh, that does it. Hang on. Every time anybody in ZF says something racist, the racist bell is going to be dinged, okay? Oh, oh, Jesus. Oh, I'm just going to apologize, guys. Racism is wrong. Don't. Let's just get through this. We're in the oh, Vietnam right. War. We're not allowed to be racist, okay? No, we were the US last round. You need to change sides. Are you playing as the Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. I got kicked because of Hai Ping. Sounds like a Vietnamese general, that Hai Ping. <laughs> God damn. Mm. It's also, I mean... Okay, just, just look up some Vietnamese names, guys. Actually, here, I'm going to do something. I'm going to push back against this nonsense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys... Okay, uh... A decent account of the Vietnam War t written by a Vietnam recon soldier, sort of one of their elite troops, is The Sorrow of War by Bao Nin, um, B-A-O -B space N-I-N-H, not ping. Um, uh, great account of the Vietnam War, um, also a great account of PTSD. And when I talked about the isolation and sort of the emotional deadening effects of PTSD, uh, this is, it, it really captures that. And it's a controversial novel because it was originally published in Vietnamese. And it was one of the first to talk about the deep scars and suffering of the North Vietnamese troops that fought that war. For most of the time, the official narrative of the state is that every one of them is our heroes. They never suffered PTSD because of the strong moral character of their cause defending their nation. And so the very idea that veterans of that war have, have experienced any kind of mental illness or ill repercussions from it um, is controversial in and of itself and was groundbreaking. This Chinese knockoff version of the AK was pretty good. Oh yeah, the, the red cake. Yeah. Racist spell. <laughs> Got landing shotgun. So Can much. You can't say that on a live stream. He's literally like. <laughs> <laughs>
No, no, no. <laughs> that's racist. It's racism. No, that's racist. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, these guys are horrible. Go back. Oh my god. <laughs> guys, guys, come on. You fuckers are doing this on purpose. If something to say, I'm not sure if it's too much. If it's so you, then it's probably too much. too much. The Viet Cong basically. <laughs> you can't say. <laughs> this is so bad. That. You cannot say that. <laughs> Did you, do you have enough machine gun there? More Daka. Are you with me, Greg? More Daka. More Daka. Yeah, more Daka. Oh! 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 As as the orcs of 40k know, more Daka. More Daka isn't always a solution to your problems, man. Sometimes a space marine with a heavy bolter, no amount of self belief in the power of Daka will stop it. No, that's not what we meant, Poro. <laughs> He just wiped out himself and an entire machine gun section. Oh, bad time to reload, bad time to reload. Oh no, I don't <laughs> <laughs> Damn, what a way to go. I'm just watching the replay. Oh, the moment I touched the magazine, that's bullshit. That is massive amounts of bullshit. No, we're losing them. The it's fine, it's fine. Pull butt, pull butt. Anyway. Back, we lose. Oh! oh! We lose. <laughs> I mean... Sometimes, it, sometimes combat comes down to just dumb luck. I'm here to tell you, sometimes these tiny details are what make or break you. And it's kind of screwed up. It's tough. It's a tough reality. It's a tough pill to swallow. But sometimes it's just the seat you got in that morning, the order of vehicles in the convoy, uh, the fact that you ate some bad tuna the night prior and had to come off the patrol can be the difference between life and death. And uh, that's true in our world too, though we're able to hide ourselves from that reality better. Moment, every time. Maybe we're just bad. Maybe you're just bad. I'm still worse though. I fucking had that. Fucking GI. Did you just? No, no. Soviet. Uh, it's the smoke. Is it, uh, it's PTSD. Smoke. PTSD, what, PTSD. I'm stressed. The smoke I'm stressed, okay. So, yeah. There are rumors that in the Vietnam War, of course, uh, what do they call it? Fragging. Uh, fragging was usually when you had a leader who was dangerously incompetent, um, which you can imagine, you got some some deluded idiots. Um, if you've read any of the accounts of the foreign volunteers for Ukraine, you have a mix. Some people are former uh, former military who have a significant training. Many of them are even f uh, combat veterans who have seen actual combat. And, but then you have a large number of people who are simply extremely worryingly, insanely naive and have little grasp of reality, almost no discernible common sense, and appear to have almost delusional or deluded beliefs about what they're going to be doing in this conflict. Uh, I argue that almost every military volunteer probably has deluded themselves a little bit, but um, I respect the people who know at least what they're getting into when they sign up for a military in conflict. Uh, those people ended up in the Vietnam War too. People who were deluded thinking that they were going to somehow, you know, lead troops or be some sort of John Wayne war hero or were just pretty dumb. And, and those people could end up in leadership billets because the army was desperate. The military was desperate for, for bodies, for warm bodies. And if you had somebody like that, there were rumors that, troops would agree that 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 officer or that nco was was due to have an accident um on patrol and would be killed or wounded um again is it is it like officially documented this fragging practice probably not um and it's tough to say how much of it was like that but you know having seen some of the dumbest leaders in the active army, who does a good job, who wasn't really hard up for 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 officers, I can only imagine the sort of e e fools that showed up to try to lead troops in Vietnam. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm PTSD. <laughs> don't push me. I would not want to be your fucking therapist. <laughs> like I don't know, like trip for like uh, Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> he finds it funny, does he? Right now we flank north. But apparently there's someone back Ooh, here. That looks no knees are not supposed to bend that way. Listen, once once you once you're dead, it doesn't matter. No, I don't like that. Wait, what happened? <laughs> I love how he killed a man, but is creeped out by a knee bending no, badly. No, no, no. Is this like the Far Cry finger? Yeah. Watch it, Titty, in front of you. You got a trap. <laughs> I saved your life. 
Ten more seconds. The enemy shot down. Oh. I still get the credit for that. Fuck. He, he saved whatever life remained. Not much. I still get the points. I would recommend not being in Bravo right now. But this is exactly how an effective obstacle can work. Right? You don't have to have the enemy fall into a trap. Just like you don't need the enemy to walk into a mine for it to be effective. What makes it effective is when it canalizes the enemy. As you saw there, it forced that target into a kill zone for the machine gun. It was a perfect technique, whereas if it wasn't there, he would be able to pass quickly through that door, out and around. Instead, he had to stop, go back and forth, allowing that machine gunner to line up their kill. Why? Ready? Oh! Yeah. Oh no! Oh god! No! I'm too pretty to die! I live! That is exactly why entrenched positions uh, can be effective at stopping airstrikes. Oftentimes, unless the airstrike falls precisely inside of your entrenched position, the, uh, in this case, napalm, but shrapnel, right? If your if the trench line is here, it will pass right over you. Shrapnel from an explosion, right? It's not foolproof, it's not certain, but it reduces the effectiveness tremendously. That's why if you know deep uh, deep lore in MHGR, you know that one of my earliest videos covered the small Vietnamese entrenching tool that allowed them to survive strikes from even the US's mighty B-52 bombers. And uh, yeah, being thwarted by a tiny shovel uh, is definitely the ultimate battlefield trolling. I've been protected by a thatch hut. Oh, what? What? Come on! Tunnel going down. I'm digging a tunnel using the power of my mind. <laughs> Evidently, it's not going to be a very large tunnel. Ah, me over exaggerated. Never. Just set me on fire. Oh. I'm, just, I'm so impressed what? with you guys. I can't oh, hear oh, you over the bro. sound of my sniper. <laughs> Asking ZF not to set you on fire is begging them to set you on fire. But begging them to set you on fire will also get you set on fire. Yeah! <laughs> My guys have got to push forward, they can't stay. All we can do here is die! Oh, fuck me! BC in the central tower. Fuck, it all, right? fuck me. Well, they had a sniper, but I don't know if he's dead. Okay. Damn, that was a close call. This is what, what being suppressed is. Yeah. We've talked about it in other videos, suppression, when you just can't even peek your head over without getting shot at. Whoa, fuck me. That squad spawn on me. This will be the last push. Yes, we did it. Oh. Fuck it hell. Right. Are you fucking kidding? I need a bandage. Oh, no. Fucking miracle, that's what I need. Fucking pin. No. Well, three of us are pinned. Is that a grenade? That better be a grenade. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yes, this is why we talk about dispersion sometimes. And it's tough to do on the battlefield, as they just saw. That's a completely realistic sequence of events in which you end up with lots of soldiers bunched up behind cover to a dangerous degree. And it, put, it means that you're liable to get struck by a mortar, grenade, or other indirect fire, and that it'll kill off a lot of your personnel. This can be even more dangerous when you have leaders. Oftentimes, leaders need to confer about different issues on the battlefield. And sometimes if you are too densely packed, it can create risk. Because imagine having a squad leader, platoon leader, and two team leaders taken out by a single stray mortar round grenade or even just a good spray of a machine gun. But again, oftentimes you don't have a choice. You have to confer. You have to communicate about the mission. Michael, the Punisher just wiped the entire squad. This is not going well. We're going to push across the bridge. Gather up with me. Go team, go team. Come here, seconds. Second. Charge, no stopping, no stopping. Come you on, charge. Stop. Go, go, charge. Oh, this man. isn't charging. This is hiding behind the APC. Right, this is, this is the problem. They're trying to cross a linear danger area, a bridge, and they're trying to do so without having suppressing fire. What should happen is that some of their forces should be engaging the enemy, either firing rounds across the bridge or even more productively tossing grenades, something to get the enemy's head down while other elements bound across. And then once the ele the uh, elements have bounded across, they're going to take up fighting positions and they're going to provide the suppression while the second half of them cross. This whole push hard across the bridge, not a great call without some fire support. Very dead, very dead. Charge! Right Charge! 
The general term is fire and maneuver. And right now there's maneuvering and not any firing. Right, without suppressive fire, all you've done is create a shooting gallery. And Welcome that, the as War. they say, is that for poor Soviet, right? His, his guys, you know, fighting as a team is OP. It's OP in real warfare. Communicating, working together, training together, and knowing your plan before you execute it are all things that can be decisive on the battlefield. Um, and ZF basically isn't any of those things. So that's why you see these sort of comically bad uh run around nonsense anyway guys thanks so much for joining me also gotta say a big thank you to the patrons of patreon these guys are uh supporting the channel they have access to exclusive content exclusive reactions and uh get access to an exclusive room on the discord so thanks to our lieutenant to your patrons cole foster command unit caffeinated jacob flavius chris dr shadowcop porter world time brandon armitage tell ruin and astro hunter thanks again to you guys and be sure to follow me on twitch where i do live reactions play some video games and generally have some fun and until next time i'll see you guys later